most of the research that people are talking about right now is surrounding fasting, a caloric deficit, or a lower carb protocol when it comes down to longevity. And that kind of makes us think that carbs are automatically the enemy. Now, when you look on paper, it's deceiving because it does kind of imply that if you're not following this lower carb ketogenic approach, then you're missing out on a lot of the longevity benefits, right? Well, to a certain degree, that is true. But one of the big holes that I want to be able to poke in this so that we can really objectively look at the data and understand what the best process for us is, is look at the blue zones, right? Things like Costa Rica, like Okinawa, like the Mediterranean, these regions that have people that really do live for a long period of time, they generally eat pretty high carbohydrate counts and a fair bit of fruit. So we're gonna dive into that. We're gonna talk about the blue zones. We're also gonna come through with a solution, like a cyclical kind of diet that you might be able to follow that perhaps gets us the best of all these worlds. And remember that a lot of the longevity research is in rodent models. We can't put humans in a metabolic chamber for their entire lifetime to measure how long they live. That's, that's, that's just rude. But we can do it with rodents. Apparently that's not as rude. Speaking of rodents, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell Metabolism that took a look at mice, and when they got to the age of 12 months, they put them on a control diet or they put them on a keto diet for the remainder of their lives. The mice that were on the keto diet did live substantially longer okay, than the control group, but they also preserved physiological function better. That means they didn't just live a long, miserable life in a mouse nursing home, just hating their life. They actually retained muscular function, they retained organ function, things were working well. Now the researchers kind of hypothesized that it probably had something to do with a decreased action of mTOR, which we can talk a little bit more about in a minute, but it's not super important. Bottom line is we're lacking human evidence, but there's still some interesting stuff. What we do know about ketones, now again, this video isn't designed to be just pro-keto. Again, I have a solution that is a little bit more unbiased, let's put it that way. But we do know with ketones, from what we've seen in mechanistic studies, is that ketones activate or express what's called FOXO3. FOXO3 is in charge of expressing more what are called endogenous antioxidants. So the antioxidants in our body that really do stave off some of the effects of aging, right? So things like uh, superoxide dismutase, glutathione, things like that. If we're expressing more of those, then that means we're activating more of those. And ketones do seem to, at least in mechanistic studies, have that action. We also have seen that ketones seem to block the inflammatory cascade which means if we are potentially modulating inflammation, then maybe we're affecting the inflammaging or the signaling of inflammation and how it affects the brain in an aging just organism. So yes, there's a lot of evidence that points there. But the interesting thing is, it's not all about the ketones. What's really wild is that if you look at the big picture, it's not necessarily the presence of ketones. Yes, those have powerful effects, Maybe it's the absence of the overconsumption of carbohydrates per a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. Okay, this was pretty cool because this Diabetes Care study took a look at normal BMI, okay, non-overweight individuals that were not diabetic, okay, and it determined that levels of insulin resistance were a positive indicator of mortality. So the higher the levels of insulin resistance, they were able to predict mortality better, which tells us that the reason behind a lower carbohydrate approach might just be the modulation of insulin resistance, bringing that insulin resistance down. But you can have healthy levels of you know, insulin sensitivity and not be insulin resistant while not being on a ketogenic diet. So it's not just sitting in the keto camp. We can still have carbohydrates, but let's break this down even more because this is where it gets super intriguing. There was a new study that was published in the journal Gerontology. Okay, this is a new study. And it took a look at carbohydrate consumption and it found that glycemic index, glycemic load, and even overall carbohydrate consumption were not really linked with successful aging. There was nothing really correlating that with successful or unsuccessful aging. Meaning people could eat 500 grams of carbs and they probably didn't look that intensely, but, and it didn't really affect aging. But where it gets really intriguing was fiber intake did, okay? They were able to see that what did matter as far as successful aging was concerned was the amount of fiber they consumed. So even if someone ate like 200 grams of a high glycemic carbohydrate versus 200 grams of a carbohydrate that also had 50 grams of fiber in it, 
the person that had more fiber, had more fiber, was going to have better markers of quote unquote successful aging. So it isn't necessarily the carbohydrates. Maybe it's how much fiber we have how fiber plays a role with insulin resistance. Big picture stuff. We can't say that fiber is gonna make you live forever or fiber is gonna give you longevity. We can't definitively say that because we have no observational studies in humans of people in metabolic chambers for 200 years. We have to look at mechanisms, but this starts opening the doors to a more holistic look, okay? Now I caution you, just because you reduce carbohydrate consumption doesn't mean that you go willy-nilly and increase fat consumption. So when you look at very low levels of LDL, well, there's evidence from the British Journal of Nutrition that that's associated with mortality. When you look at high levels of LDL, that's also associated with mortality. So it doesn't mean that we go eat a ton of fats and eat you know, 15 ribeye steaks every week, but it also doesn't mean that we cut out red meat and saturated fat altogether because too low of LDL is bad too, right? We're starting to see a common theme here of balance, but balance is not really what we want to talk about. That's kind of boring. There are things, and there are interesting things that the researchers are seeing, okay? Now, with the gut diversity thing, that's a very interesting piece, and outside of the longevity piece altogether, I always do recommend keeping your gut diverse. I think that that's a great direction to go no matter what, because the microbiome is, I don't know, it could be a big player when we start looking at this big picture. Today's video, FYI, there is a link for 15% off of my preferred probiotic, the one that I use. In no way, shape, or form am I saying a probiotic is going to contribute to longevity or anything like that. I just think in the context of talking about a healthy microbiome, it makes sense and people ask all the time which one I use. So 15% off using the link down below. It is awesome stuff. Cool technology with a capsule inside a capsule so you get the proper delivery. So you're getting the staging that you're looking for with one capsule that kind of breaks down first and then the second stage of that capsule breaking down later. Okay, so there's a prebiotic and a probiotic together making it what's called a symbiotic. It's called seed and they're in the forefront of a lot of microbiome research too. So check them out. Even if you don't buy the product, I recommend that you check them out and look at the research they're doing. It's pretty awesome. But if you do want to try it, it's 15% off using that link down below. So it really isn't about good versus bad, like carbs being good or bad or fats being good or bad. Okay, just like we see with the high LDL, low LDL thing, right? It's all about context. And then when we look at carbohydrates, it's about context too, right? High levels of carbohydrates don't necessarily mean you're gonna age more, but high levels of carbohydrates in the absence of fiber perhaps do. Now here's the big dilemma, and this is really getting to the meat of this video here. If carbs and insulin resistance is really the problem, then that would imply that keto is the only way forward. And as I've addressed earlier in this video, Keto has a lot of evidence going towards it in the way of longevity. It really does, and I think researchers are starting to double down on that. We're seeing a lot of that. Okay, there's something there, but what's really kind of going on big picture? We really shouldn't do a keto diet for too long, because here's what you have to remember. When we oxidize fats, like burn fats for fuel, believe it or not, it creates a lot of reactive oxygen species. People don't want to believe that. They think it's only like a Prius versus a diesel truck, right? Burning fats creates reactive oxygen species, re oxidative stress. Why? Because reactive oxygen species are a signaling device. So what that means is when you are in ketosis, it's a hormetic stressor. The stress of being in ketosis creates stress responses, oxidative stress, so oxidative damage. But that oxidative stress signals the body to adapt and get stronger and create more mitochondria. Simple analogy is the same kind of way a workout creates a lot of oxidative stress. If you work out a lot, you're doing a lot of reactive oxygen, you're creating a lot of reactive oxygen species, you just are. But those reactive oxygen species travel around and they act as a signal that, oh man, if I'm gonna keep up with the kind of workouts this dude is doing, I need to start upregulating some cells and systems and processes because I can't live like this. I need to level up. Well, keto does the same thing. My point in saying that is that goes against the grain of like longevity. You can't do that forever, right? You can't just bombard your body with reactive oxygen species and never give yourself the ability to actually build from it. So that, where, that is where like an, a cyclical kind of approach comes into play. Our cells really do like being flexible. They like being able to use multiple substrates, being able to use fats, and then also being able to use carbohydrates. It's actually better for them to be dual fueled and understand that. 
So with a cyclical ketogenic approach, you can gain the potential benefits from a longevity perspective as far as FOXO3, as far as a nuclear factor kappa B, like the inflammatory cascade kind of interruption that you have there, but you also get the insulin sensitivity that comes with that too, right? You're avoiding carbohydrates, insulin resistance is gonna come down, but you're also giving yourself adequate time off to be able to get rest from the reactive oxygen species. To give you some context and example, like for myself, when I go on a ketogenic diet, I really do notice in the first month or so, I feel like I feel younger. Like I, this is my own anecdotal thing, so you can't take it to the bank, but my experience and to give context, I feel like my skin looks better, my skin looks fresher, I have more of a glow, people usually comment on it. And then about three, four months into keto, I start to come backwards a little bit and I actually start looking a little drawn out and a little tired and a little more old. And then what I do is I say, okay, well, maybe my body's just overwhelmed with the reactive oxygen species. I come off of keto for about three or four weeks, okay? And during that time, I start looking fresher and younger and feeling fresher and younger again. And then after about three or four weeks, the same thing kind of starts to happen. And that effect kind of wanes off. And then I go back keto and I feel like it improves again. And again, it's anecdotal, but it's almost like this two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back because you're allowing your body to reap the benefits of what you got out of the ketogenic diet while allowing the self to recover from that reactive oxygen species and allow the cellular adaptation, the mitochondrial adaptation to occur. Now, another very important thing we cannot forget is that carbohydrates are also very important for mTOR stimulation. Now, when we get into the world of longevity, this is really interesting territory and can upset a lot of people, but mTOR still plays a role. Okay, mTOR still plays a role in keeping us youthful. Okay, mTOR is going to be the anabolic signal, which allows us to maintain muscle. Muscle is a secretary organ. Muscle is not just an appendage that hangs from your body that is metabolically expensive to hang on to. Muscle signals to keep us alive. It keeps us relevant. When we have muscle on us, we are metabolically active. Not only is that good for fat burning, but it's signaling to the brain and signaling to the rest of the organs that, hey, this person's healthy, they're moving around, they're good, they're, they're active, keep everything rocking and rolling. That's why sarcopenia, muscle wasting, is so strongly correlated with frailty, disease, death, dying, right? There's very, very clear pictures there that people, when they're sick, they start to waste muscle. So maintaining muscle is important. So carbohydrates and having occasional insulin spikes are important to that. All the reason why, hey, a cyclical ketogenic diet could be a really good approach. Three months keto, three, four weeks off. Three months keto, three, four weeks off. And don't be afraid to have the occasional carbohydrate when you're doing keto to balance that. So now let's look at these blue zones for just a second. What is interesting about blue zones? They consume like 60% of their diet being carbohydrates. So 60% of their diet is usually carbs. Okay, what is interesting about it though is it's a pretty low fat approach, but it's pretty high fiber too. Okay, lots of root vegetables, lots of legumes, lots of sweet potatoes, things like that. So even though the carbohydrate consumption is quite high, the protein consumption is pretty high too, but the overall fiber consumption is very high. And probably the most important thing is generally speaking, like when you look at the Okinawans, they sit in on average a 15% caloric deficit every day. So they're always in a little bit of a deficit. That deficit is going to improve what's called the NAD to NADH ratio. I have plenty of videos on that. Just type in Thomas DeLauer NAD or Thomas DeLauer NADH because that would make this video 40 minutes long. Okay, so essentially you have pro longevity effects that come, come into play from potential caloric restriction. But then there's a lot of other variables there. Insulin resistance, all this and that. But the fiber intake probably plays the biggest part. Because they consume so much fiber, there's going to be a higher abundance of short chain fatty acids, which are the end product of fiber, basically getting broken down by the microbiome. These short chain fatty acids can increase production of what's called PYY. They can increase production of another thing called glucagon-like peptide, both of which are strongly correlated with appetite suppression. So the high fiber intake is perhaps making them less hungry, which is leading to them consuming less food and being in that consistent mild caloric deficit, which seems to be pretty good according to the longevity research. So just to recap, a few things to know surrounding the world of carbs being good or bad for aging. Here's what you kind of want to follow. Cyclical ketogenic dieting, okay? Periods of a hormetic stressor, intermittent fasting if you don't want to do keto, so you're putting your body in that deficit, okay? And then periods of carbohydrates. 
very high fiber intake. Okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that vegetables are generally pretty good. Some people don't like to believe that. I understand, that's fine. I'm gonna go on record and say I think they're good. The occasional mTOR spike, okay? So carbohydrates now and then. Keeping the weight training going, keeping the resistance training going, so you're having localized and global mTOR elevation at the right times to maintain muscle, okay? That's very important. Proper spacing between your meals so that you have a little time for your insulin levels to come back down so you're not constantly bombarding your cells with insulin so you don't develop insulin resistance. So have very clear, distinct meals. Again, those blue zones are not big grazers. They eat larger meals that are very spaced apart and typically are more like social gatherings and they eat larger midday meals and a little bit less at night. Another piece that kind of doubles up on that is having these 12 hour gaps, like stop eating at like six or 7 p.m. and don't continue to eat again until like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. 12 hour gaps to allow insulin sensitivity to improve. And then another piece that I think is very important that we also have to look at with these blue zones that's not necessarily dietary is sunlight. Getting that vitamin D3, that another sign that we're alive and well. Think about it from a biological sort of evolutionary perspective. We're outside, we have muscle, we're eating, that means that we're alive. Keep everything going, you're nourishing your body. Once these things start to chip away little bit by little bit and by process of elimination, eventually you're left with nothing, then guess what? You know, do the math. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.